Do you guys need a lift? <laughs> you came and saved us. Our plans have changed quite dramatically in the last little while. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Got some revs on? Yeah. On the air intake? Yeah, I've just mopped a little bit up. If you missed last week, we are now in Panama City on the Pacific side. We've been exploring the area. Getting familiar with all the hardware stores on this coast. This is a uh, kitty hair. As we tick off the last few jobs before we set our sails out of this bumpy anchorage. Mm. You weren't staying for that long. <laughs> Not the best start to a morning we've ever had. We were just looking to fly the drone around the anchorage here and get some shots and for some reason the drone ended up smacking into one of the shrouds. I took it just straight off like we normally do. Um, but for some reason, I don't know what was wrong with it. It just decided to come back really hard and just hit into our mizzen, our shrouds, flipped over, landed in the water. I jumped in and got it, pulled it up, and this is where we're at at the moment with it. It's drying out right now. What's in the bag? The drone. What? It's now the evening and we've, if I'm honest, we've had a pretty average day. Obviously this morning the drone crashed into the mizzen, went in the sea, just, it's something so little to so many people, but we saved for so many months for this bloody drone. We got it in the sandblast as our Christmas present to each other. We're trying to up our filming game. Um, and I guess in a house, you can just pop into town and buy one. On a boat, it's not too easy. Anyway, enough ranting and raving from me. So try and cheer the day up. Zach's making some nachos and our friends Gabby and Ian gifted us the sweetest thing. And I just got to show you. They gifted us some bean bags and Zach for months has wanted bean bags, but we couldn't find any that were right. And they had some old ones that they were getting rid of and they gave them to us. So that's a highlight of the day. <laughs> and now Zach is putting nacho material together. Do we trust those glasses? Oh. Just had a little stretching session on the board, on the board, on the boat, and now we're going to do something really exciting. We're going to finally install our new Kemp stack packs. They're grey. Very exciting. Um, they're still making the bimini, so that's going to be coming in about a month, I think. But for now, we just can't wait any longer, and we're going to whack our new stack pack on. I think it's a bit of a stack packs. Stat pack, sorry, yes. Mizzen and main. I think it might be a little bit of a different design than before. They are different, for sure. Um, but this is a complete kind of new surprise to us, so we don't really know how they look. Saw them on Rob Kemp's boat, haven't we? Yeah, so we were on Rob's boat and we were oogling over his stack packs and he says, well, your guys is, they are, they are pretty old now. <laughs> I don't know how old they are, 15 years old or they something. They patched them up for us probably it's probably almost two years ago they patched them up for us, didn't they? But as we're getting further and further away from the UK now, um, it's getting harder and harder to get packages out like this. So we want to change them so they last for the foreseeable future. There's only so much mending and UV coating they can do. So yeah, I'm very excited to get these on. There you go. Really, yeah. Oh yeah. Ooh, Mr. Taylor. So this is the before. Old design. This is the old design with the 
the necks like this and they are needing a little bit of love now we carabiner so it doesn't pull uh pull forward but and no, this is the uv damage i've just pulled that off but slowly all this stuff does get just like yeah look at that so these are old now but yeah we've had them we've had them patched up a few times So this design comes with what we like to call a neck and it's a separate piece that you clip on to cover kind of a full bit of the sail but the new design doesn't have that and it's all one big sock almost. Very exciting because these you have to put down below and run and get them when you're slashing the sail away. Okay, Zach, tell me what's happening. Becca lost the key. I didn't lose the key, I dropped the key in the water. Oh, there's a difference. Yeah, true. Okay. <laughs> nice romantic boat ride. <laughs> <laughs> Bye! Bye. <laughs> Perfect. It's beautiful. <laughs> so yeah, as Zach said, the key that I had attached, the floaty bit of the key ring came unattached and we ended up, well, I ended up letting it go in the water, so. Now Zach is rowing me back to the boat. Well, the tide's going with us. We're getting pulled out. It's nice. Yeah, it'd be pretty hard if it was the other way. <laughs> hey, friends. Do you guys need a lift? <laughs> you came and saved us. We'll tell you, yeah? Thanks, guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're not going to say no. Do you want to secure that? Yeah. You... Do an insert and do a push. <laughs> insert and push. Thank I, you. We can just hold on next to you. Think I'll be alright? So? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That should be probably better. Thank you. Oh, it's in this load line getting wrapped around props or anything. Yeah, yeah. I can both also sit and I can hold on there. There you go. Hold this. Look at the new stack packs! Wow. Fancy! Now we just need to match the bimini. <laughs> well that was quite the adventure. But we're back on board now. Oh, that's a bright one. Open this hatch up. Uh, air going through. But, that was, yeah, very interesting. The guy who came to see the outboard, I don't know if we even said, but we went to the dock to meet a guy who wants to buy our Suzuki because you know we've got the electric one but we listed this one on a whatsapp group and a guy instantly messaged us saying I want it and he came and just saw it yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. we love that little it's motor two -stroke and it's, it's pretty bomb proof his name's Ali he's been sailing since 1975 or something crazy left Germany then and spent 20 years in the med 20 years here, he spent a year in Colombia, no, six years in Colombia, a year in San Blas, he's been all over the place. Used to sail an oak built boat, a wooden boat, now he has a steel boat, but he is, for those sailors out there, he is Eric Bauhaus's dad. And Eric Bauhaus has written a Panama cruising guide and it's pretty much the bible of the area, and for the San Blas especially. He's written all his own charts and it's a really great book. So we actually got it for the PC when we were in San Blas. And he came out with this story of how Eric got his name. I couldn't believe it. This guy's a proper salty sailor. And he, when he started this story I knew it was going to be an amazing one. Um, and he said essentially in Turkey, 
uh, he had this baby, his wife gave birth to the baby on the boat and they went to leave Turkey and they said, you have to register the baby. And he said, oh, okay, well, the baby was, is three months old um, and his name's, I can't remember his name, it was an Israeli name actually, but this is his name. And the, the agency or the immigration there said, nope, he, the baby has to be a month old and have a German name. Oh, it's the German embassy. And so he said, okay, well, the baby was born one month ago. <laughs> And the embassy gave him 200 names to choose from and he kind of, okay, Eric then. And that's how Eric has his name. Um, he does actually go by his uh, birth given name, but it was actually a really nice name. I'm really sad I can't remember it, but yeah, Eric is the name that he goes by professionally now. Um, crazy story. And you just know this guy has seen some things and lived some lives. I'm happy our outboard is going to a, a guy like that. You know, it'll get some good use. <laughs> Um, but no, he's coming back tomorrow to collect it and we're just leaving it with our friends on the dock in the marina for now, just for ease. Ooh! Yum, thanks Zach. Do you have a knife and fork out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yum, thank you. Oh. Why are you facing this way and they're facing that way? Tide. So on the Pacific side of... Pacific side of what? On the Pacific side, we have tides. On the Atlantic side, near the equator, you don't have tides. And it's not to do with the moon, but to do with the geographical... No, no so... <laughs> I, I knew that was going wrong. So... That can explain it far better than I can. I don't know the exact phenomenon for it, but in most cases, when you get away from the equator, you get slightly more tides than you do at the equator. The Caribbean doesn't really get any tides because of that. But on the other side of Panama, which is the same, very similar uh, longitude and latitude, everything, it's... Coffee's almost done, mate. Same latitude. You get long, you get big tides because of the geography of the Pacific Ocean. The big basin in the Pacific basically means that the inertia of the water in the Pacific pulls out water from this region and pushes it back in. It's a different effect to normal tides. Which is the moon. Which is the moon, yeah. Yeah. But so the ultimately the moon and the sun, sun a little bit, moon mostly, control the tides. Multitasking. And um, the geography also has a big play. So all the places which have got the kind of biggest tidal ranges in the world, Bay of Fundy, Bristol Channel, those places are a lot to do with the geography of those areas for like water funneling out of small areas and getting funneled into small, that kind of thing that affects it a lot. But here it's because of the Pacific Basin, basically. We'll put a proper link below to an article that explains it far better than I can explain it, but that's kind of the reason. But ultimately yeah. it's still the moon controlling the tides here. It is. Um, but I'll actually get up my phone and show you Navionics right now. When we dropped anchor, we had nine meters below us and now we have five which obviously means it's low tide but i'll explain yeah it's actually spinning even more crazy now i'll explain a bit more so we're actually low tide which is 0.13 meters and the high tide at the moment is oh, it's not crazily high zach 4.13 someone said something about six meter tides in a full moon we don't have that, but what we do have is the catamarans acting very differently than the mono holes. Usually the monos are a lot more affected by current and tide than the catamarans because they're lighter and they have less of a keel. So they sit on top of the water and get affected by the wind. And you can really see it now. And normally because catamarans have more windage as well than monos. Yeah. Normally, not always. But what's happening now is really apparent. Um, and I'll show you because this is why you shouldn't anchor too close to people firstly but also when there's big tides and you should anchor close to people with similar boats keels. to you so that's why yeah. we, if we see other catches that we know are encapsulated keels we'll tend to anchor close to them instead of other boats because we know they'll swim the same way as us most of the time mm -hmm. other little things do affect it this is wild we're actually facing the opposite direction so we're facing this way that's facing that way and more monos facing that way two more monos facing that way and then there's a cat over there facing this way and actually two boats facing that way 
An easy way to tell is to look at the wind and the wind is on our beam right now which means there's some tide yeah five five meters usually if you're wondering whether the current is affecting you turn on your wind instruments and if the wind is coming from any other direction other than dead ahead you know it's the current affecting you which for us we're on i don't know we've got the wind off our beam so yeah currents are crazy if you're enjoying our journey and want to see more trust us when we say there is a lot of um crazy footage on the horizon consider clicking subscribe and letting us know below what brought you here Whose boat is this, Zach, and why are we boarding it? I don't know, it's just some random person's boat, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, our friends Brown and Eileen on Blown Away have kindly let us tie to their dinghy and borrow their key car for the marina. Big dinghy. Uh, not dinghy, <laughs> tied to their, their boat. And yeah, they've left a key card for us, which is so kind um, because it's $10 a day for the dinghy dock. So don't tell anyone, but yeah, it's very nice of them. Hello, Raccoon. We just ended up in this strange duty-free place which must be set up just for cruise ships. It's the cruise ship terminal. But it was so expensive in there too. Get... It was way more than the supermarket as well. You go into the supermarket and everything's half price. Um, so the word duty-free doesn't always mean cheaper. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> he said come to the restaurant. <laughs> It's so empty here though. I imagine when a cruise ship's in here it's really busy, but right now it's like eight people in here. Yeah, I didn't know if we mentioned, but we're at the other marina. It's actually a bigger marina. Um, it's really fancy. It is really fancy, full of lots of security guards and... Really expensive boats. Panama City. Very cool. We thought we'd sit down and kind of talk to you about how our plans have changed quite dramatically in the last little while. We kind of started having a few ideas about changing our plans actually back in the sandblast but we've been kind of swinging each way ever since and in the last few days we've confirmed that we are going to change our plans but yeah as you all know we were going to cross the Pacific and we were going to transit the canal which we've done now and we were going to cross to the Marquesas in French Polynesia. Which we um, still will do. Which we still will do. Um, but we were going to do it in kind of March this year. Um, and yeah, a few things have led to us now changing plans and we're not doing that now. So we're wanting to slow down a little bit. The boat isn't 100% ready yet. We could, like, we could do that crossing quite happily. Um, there's still a few things that we need to install before we go to French Polynesia, which will get some of them done in the next month or so. Yeah. But we just feel like the boat isn't quite where we want it to be for staying out in the like Marquesas and French Polynesia for potentially a couple of years because we really don't want to rush the Pacific. And the last thing we want to do is get out there and then realize that we need to do so many other things to the boat to get it ready to be out there for that long and rush through there and make it to the next place we can do that which would probably be New Zealand. So we're looking at the moment or we are going to go up through Central America, go to Costa Rica and then maybe do a few other countries in between. We haven't quite decided that out yet or figured that out yet. And then we're going to go up to Mexico for Hurry. cyclone season. Yeah. So yeah, that's the plan. It's been actually a really hard decision, but easy decision at the same time. Uh, one of the hardest things is we're leaving behind a lot of our friends who are going across the Pacific and we spent a lot of time with them recently. Um, so that is really difficult, but we know in our hearts 
that the boat isn't ready. It's more the lack of infrastructure on the other side. There's still things we want to get done. Yeah. The, we could quite happily cross if we provisioned in the next few days. We could quite happily cross next week, I think, if we yeah. wanted to. We do need to add a water maker. That's the number one priority. Yeah, that's the only thing that we need to add. And we've been saving for that for quite a while, um, but we should hopefully be adding that soon. Um, but it's other things which at this point are kind of more luxuries you know we want a solar arch so we can add more solar we want a swim platform a, we want to build a hard dodger and whilst we could wait to New Zealand we don't want to feel like those are the reasons we're skipping through the Pacific too quickly yeah um, and I think really in the sandblast we we wished we could almost slow down obviously we're somewhat bound by the hurricane seasons um, but I think we really yeah found that there that why were we going so fast? We have no time limit, so to say. Um, let's stop and smell the, smell the roses along the way, as one of our patrons put it really nicely. Um, but yeah, that's the plan. We're really excited about going up there. And it does look amazing. There'll be a lot of good facilities up there to get the boat work done and stuff like that. And we'll be super close to the US, so it'll be very easy to get a lot of bits of kit for the boat. I think it is going to be a bit of a challenging trip up the coast at times because you're against the current and, and the wind often but you know but we've got about six months to make it up yeah. there so we've got loads of time um, and we're really excited you know we haven't seen costa rica we haven't seen mexico um i don't know when we'll be back like we said in the i don't know when we'll be back so why not just stop and see these places while we can um, and then the benefit of that also is if we Across from Mexico to the Marquesas, we've got a thousand miles less sailing to do for that big passage. So it takes a 30 day sail down to 20 days. Um, so just like the Atlantic again. Um, so there's, yeah, there's lots of benefits and we're really looking forward to Mexican food and yeah. <laughs> exploring Mexico and Costa Rica is one of my dream places as well. And Zach's really looking forward to the surf along the coast. And yeah, it, it is the right decision, um, even though it was pretty tricky to kind of come to that decision for a little while yeah but i think in um next couple of weeks we can start like making our way up along the coast of panama and then hopefully in about a month or so we'll go into costa rica yeah which is, is apparently meant to be a pain to get into and incredibly expensive but we don't want to miss and it and a pain to check out of, <laughs> and you've got to pay for every anchorage and so i don't know how yeah. long we'll be in costa rica for but we um, don't want to miss it yeah we will go there for a bit yeah um, but yeah, stick around if you want to see some Mexican content and our plans diverge a bit, but that's the update for now. We've been wanting to check out the local bio museum for a while now. And with the boat jobs checked off the list, it was time to learn a bit about the biodiversity in Panama. Everything north of here is all man-made, which is kind of crazy. Up until the bridge over there is all man-made. Mental. This is a pretty cool place, Zach. This is cool. Let's talk about sponges. Zach loves a sponge. Loves sponges. When the two continents connected, there was a big exchange of animals from North America and from South America. Some moved south and some moved north, and the ones that did well are still around today. Yeah. So. Not any of these, though, really, are they? No, <laughs> but raccoons and sloths, they, they did a trade. Yeah. We're reading about terror birds which were huge flightless birds along with meat-eating marsupials they were the largest carnivals in south america could you imagine just walking down the street and seeing one of <laughs> seeing one of those a ground sloth skull yeah they also reassembled it though you can see all the filler in between it, so it wasn't quite complete was it but very cool pretty amazing still three thousand kilos ground sloths were that yeah she's a big girl <laughs> So 
So this morning we are finally heading to Las Perlas, which is some islands just 40 odd miles off Panama. We did not sleep well, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. The anchorage last night was just so rolly. Um, and about 5 a.m. we had the worst wave hit us that I think it was, yeah, definitely the worst wave on anchor we've ever had, but the boat went crazy and it woke us both up instantly. Um, Zach ended up on the wall. <laughs> he was sleeping and he ended up on the wall. And we had just bought some plants and they all fell over in the cockpit and the soil went everywhere and it was crazy. I don't know. We looked out and we couldn't see any boats around. I think it must have been a big ship out there, but <sighs> feeling pretty tired. That was at like 4.30 a.m. So yeah, didn't sleep too well, but that's not going to stop us. We've got 40 miles to sail today. 15 knots on our beam, seas are small, should be a nice sail. We're hoping to throw up our new Genoa. And yeah, hopefully, hopefully it all goes well. Obviously when you install something new, there's always gonna be kinks you need to iron out. Um, but no, we're looking forward to today's sail. And we've got the bean bag, so maybe we'll have a little <sighs> sail nap along the way. <laughs> I also look how I feel, I'm just very creased and Squiffy, that's the word. I feel squiffy, I look squiffy. So we haven't left. Um, our engine won't start. <laughs> we thought it was the batteries maybe being flat, so we put them on charge. We cleaned up all the terminals, sanded everything. Um, and it sounded like it was cranking more when we turned the key off. There was a bubbling sound coming from the air intake on the engine and a torch please yeah and it smells kind of like it's burning so zach thinks there's water in the air intake which i wouldn't i don't know how that would have got in there it looks like there is yeah there is as well. yeah it's really annoying because we've never had engine issues and then the last few weeks we've just i think it's been different things each time but it's just frustrating because you know it's there's no wind out there but if there was if there was, I don't know, 30 knots of wind right now, or we started dragging, or we had to move, I don't know, it's just not a nice feeling to not have an engine on anchor, but luckily there's no wind forecasted. Zach here. It's like slightly salty, but not really. So it feels more like steam than anything. Hey Stuart. Hello mate, how you doing? Yeah, good. Mate, let me just turn this off. Hey. <laughs> On the air intake? Yeah. Yeah, I've just mopped a little bit up. And it's, it's just clean water, is it? It it tastes maybe a tiny bit salty, but it's mostly fresh. It's not, did you taste any antifreeze in it? I didn't taste any anti- I don't think it's antifreeze. I don't know. It's hard to tell. So, you got to be careful. Don't start it with water in it because it'll blow the pistons. It'll hydraulic. Okay. The only way that's got in there is probably for the heat game. Do you think it might just be condensation, do you think? Yeah, but you, you mopped a bit. To, how much is a bit you mopped out, do you think? Um, not like, not a crazy amount but there's like i'll show you in here that's the intake there and then just at the bottom there see it all right there's like a a little bit of water in there oh no that's all right then so just sitting in that little groove there at the bottom the battery charge has just gone into absorption so we're going to give it another go zach's got the air intake off and he's gonna just wait before you do anything. He's just gonna see whether there's any water in it. It um, just looked like condensation before, but it's good to check. I'm just gonna put the housing on, but not the filter. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Got some revs on? Yeah. Woo! It sounds a bit like coffee. It doesn't sound right. It's like pop, 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 pop.
but it sounds like it's panting a bit. It's like. 